Hello, everybody. Just uh, we're just waiting for a few more people to come on board, so um, we won't be long. We'll be starting in a, a minute or so. Well, I'm going to kick things off. Um, welcome. We, I'm sure we'll have a few more people join us as the time goes on. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Kathy Borman. I'm the CEO for One Door Mental Health. It's exciting. This is our second day of our e-symposium, um, focusing on Schizophrenia Awareness Week. Um, and it's been a great um, launch to Schizophrenia Awareness Week. And I hope you've joined or are planning to join some of the other webinars that we've got. Um, before I commence, before I introduce um, our wonderful speaker, I'll just do a little bit of acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, various lands on which we're meeting, um, to their people and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, all the people that lived experience that are with us, as we walk together towards a world in which people with mental illness are valued and treated as equals. So welcome. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. You'll notice the chat, which you can find down the bottom of your screen. If you um, want to ask a question to the minister, um, if you can pose that question there. Uh, we are recording this for later, um, but um, you won't be able to ask any questions audibly, so that will be where it is. We've got the Minister for 40 minutes, which is fantastic, um, and uh, so we'll um, hopefully be able to get to most of your questions. So I'd just like to welcome uh, Minister Bronnie Taylor. She's the Minister for Mental Health, Regional Youth and Women to speak to us today on the New South Wales Government's Policy Direction on Mental Health. I must say, uh, the Minister has a very busy portfolio. Um, I think just having mental health um, would be enough, but having the others as well, um, what, a, what a, a very huge job that you have. Um, it's also really good timing that we've got the Minister here today because on Friday, we know the Commonwealth Government released the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. Um, and it was a COAG initiative, and we know that um, Minister Taylor was uh, was supportive of this and leading the discussions around this pandemic plan. So we'll look forward to understanding what this means for us here in New South Wales. And if I can give a bit of um, background to um, Minister Taylor, um, welcome aboard. Um, she has been a nurse, um, her background is a nurse for over 20 years, specialising in cancer and palliative care. Her political career came out of her eagerness to improve the system from her experience in regional areas. Um, she started in uh, her political career as the Deputy Mayor of Kuma Manaro Shire, and then she became involved in the National Party, and then positions within the New South Wales Government as Parliamentary Secretary in 2017, and now commenced as the Minister for Regional Youth, Women and Mental Health in 2019. Um, she's happily married and she has two daughters and I also understand that her and her husband run a sheep and cattle property, uh, which is wonderful to hear. So welcome Minister. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Kathy. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I still feel so weird when people introduce, it's so funny hearing things about yourself, isn't it? So thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, thank you and good afternoon to the One Door team, friends and guests on the webinar today. 
and also the traditional owners on all the places which you are dialing in from, which is a new sort of way to welcome, isn't it? And for me here, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, look, thanks. I'm really happy to do this because I think um, I'm really proud of, of where we are and where we've come in mental health and that really doesn't have a lot to do with me. That's thanks to all, probably most of you on here today and people like yourself, Kathy, that have been working in the sector for quite some time. You're really kicking goals. And I think that we've come a long way from where we were. Yes, we have a long way to go, um, but we're fortunate, I think, to be in the moment of a rising platform and awareness of mental health, not only in New South Wales, but I think in the country. And I think we've seen that um, recently. You, you did um, mention as well about the National mental, he mental Health Pandemic Plan that we were able to sort of talk about on Friday. And I'm really pleased to say to all of you that that was a really big collaboration between New South Wales and Victoria. I really commend my Victorian colleague from the Labor Party, Martin Foley. He's a really terrific bloke and he's been absolutely wonderful to work with and he's really committed to mental health. We convened the first ever meeting of national, um, nationally, Australia-wide of mental health ministers that's never been done before. And um, COVID has given us that opportunity to do that with the, with the rising sort of awareness of mental health within our communities, which is thanks to all of you. So I'm really proud that we landed that plan. Is it gonna be everything to everyone? No. But um, I think that I think it speaks volumes that we've actually done it as a country and that we've got bipartisan collaboration across Australia on it. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really, really proud of that and my team worked really hard on it. So it's, um, it's a good thing. I think the main thing that we want to take away in the direction that I certainly want to head in is one that mental health is about healthcare in the community and doing that. I, I feel very strongly committed. My background is in primary care, so it's something that I feel very strongly about as well. But what we do know is that we want to equip people, we want to support people, and we want to care for people, and we certainly just don't want to medicate people. Um, you'll hear that much we're doing, it's driven by a desire to ensure people can lead, obviously, the most fulfilling, supported lives they can, and preferably that is out of hospital. We know that hospital has a critical role to play and those acute units have a really critical role to play. But we all know what we're striving for and that is for people to have the most fulfilling lives that they are able to have for all of us and that's in the community. Uh, look, last month, last, I think it was last month, we were able to announce a very big investment into mental health through um, the COVID-19 funding. And look, I'm always reluctant to talk in dollars, but it was a $73 million investment. And, and why I say that is that I think it was significant. And what we've been able to do there as well is to put a real focus on community. And that's what I really wanted to do. So we're also increasing community, you know, 180 new positions in the community mental health um, sector. We're looking at virtual mental health teams, which were really important to me as someone from a, a rural area, because these aren't just add-on teams, these will be new teams, new positions, providing virtual mental health care, and that will be in every single LHD across New South Wales. And I think that that's a really, really exciting thing to do. Again, as well, we're looking at alternatives to emergency care. So we're looking at, um, at, at, at at really taking on that model um, that Victoria's doing so well already with their Safe Haven Cafe that's um, based at St Vincent's. Um, we're also enhancing the, um, the mental health line, the capacity of that, so that we're able to increase, to, we're, able, we're able to increase the response to people in a crisis. Look, I have to be very honest with you, that line hasn't been performing at the level that it needs to be. So I'm really pleased with this investment. It's something that the um, psychiatrists have been really speaking and really stressing to me that was important because if we can't get that entry point right, it's really difficult then for people to navigate and access the services that they need. So, um, it, you know, as you know, we're all halfway through our, our Living Well um, mental health reform that's been undertaken by the Mental Health Commission. Um, what they wanted to was more of a focus on primary care, more of a focus on community-based services. I think we've been able to, to absolutely deliver that, particularly in this COVID response. Um, 
Are the reform programs about building a mental health system, I feel, that promotes recovery, that really needs to be our focus so that people can achieve the best quality of life that is absolutely possible. Sorry, I've got some notes here, so that's why I'm sort of flicking papers because I go off on a tangent and then I start, you know, using up all my time. So, um, look, we, we really are supposed to, and this is no news to any of you, we need to promote independence, we need to, you know, promote dignity and also one thing I've learned in my time as mental health minister, which has only been a year, is that it's individuality that really matters as well. There's no, there's no set clinical pathway for, um, for everyone. Everybody needs to have that individual thing that, that's taken in. But you all know that, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not preaching that to, to people that know it better than myself. Um, you, you asked about hearing about how our reform program ties in with the Draft Productivity Commission as well, I think. So, um, I'm pleased to say that most of our work is really progressing in that and the, the five priority areas that were outlined were prevention and early intervention for mental illness and suicide attempts and closing critical gaps in healthcare services, investment in services beyond health and assistance for people with mental illness to get into work and to enable early treatment um, and fundamental reform to care coordination, governance and also funding arrangements. And look, funding arrangements comes up in every single sector because you're all having to deal with, you know, very short timelines and it makes it really difficult for your programs. I completely understand that. We keep working on it. It's a really difficult area to land in terms of long-term funding um, agreements, but I don't think we can give up on that. You have to keep pushing us in government to deliver that for you. I have to keep pushing it around the cabinet table and we need to look at some sort of thing about how we can clearly demonstrate those things that are working so that you've got the longer funding agreements that you really need. I'm a firm believer in you sometimes don't land everything you want, but you often get the opportunity at some point. So we just need to keep that. And I, I thank you that you keep raising it with me and I encourage you to raise it with every member of government that you speak to. Um, much of the Commission's recommendations centred around building and consistent screening of children's social and emotional development to enable early intervention. So um, last year or when we were leading into the election, the government committed to, um, it was $88 million over four years, and that was to ensure that every public high school has a um, has two mental health experts. Now, I think even the fact that we've said that and we've mandated that in policy is really powerful. Um, it's something that I have been working on for quite some time and um, I was part of implementing that pilot program in Southern New South Wales for school nurses because I feel that if we can get to, we all know that if we can get to people early and we can teach them the skills to deal with things and give them the strategies that often we're gonna have much better outcomes. So I look forward to all of that rolling out. Um, it's been quite a challenge for us as a government in terms of the fact that we didn't have a lot of those roles available and a lot of those people out there. So we've had to look at a lot of training opportunities of upskilling and for people to be able to work in the education system. So that's ongoing. And um, my colleague, Sarah Mitchell, the education minister, has definitely got that on track to, to be able to be delivered. So I really can't wait till those are rolled out. Um, I also put down a talk about suicide initiatives as well. And it is one of the Premier's priorities. And although people might sort of think, oh, what's the Premier's priority? What it means for me is that the Premier has flagged that that is a really important thing for her to push forward. So it allows me the ability as the Mental Health Minister to make sure that we're rolling out programs that look at that. And um, we've also got new money for that as an investment that you know we've announced before. But we're looking at um, 20 new services which will act as safe alternatives to the emergency department, which I spoke about and which I saw for myself in Melbourne. And the, the feedback was very positive there about how that was working. So I'm really excited to be rolling that out in New South Wales and that will start this year. COVID has presented its challenges for rolling some of these things out, but I am pushing my department and pushing my branch to absolutely make sure that we get that done. I think that's one of the most imperative things of these safe spaces in terms of suicide prevention and in terms of people with an exacerbation of their mental health illness don't have to present straight to emergency departments because we just know, everybody knows that it's not the best place.
for them to be in those in those times. We're looking at specialist suicide um, outreach teams as well, and they'll respond to specific suicide crises in communities. So that will also be rolled out, and also our aftercare services for people who have attempted suicide. Um, and we're doing this by improving the follow-up care for people after they've presented after a suicide attempt. We're creating um, new specialist community mental health teams to deliver assertive care for people in the community, and also the way the way back support service um, provides three months of follow up, and that's been a really interesting one to watch and to track, and also to see that we also have to look at extending that period, and there is no magic time of three months. And look. I refer that back to my own practice as a nurse. Um, I spent quite a while as a breast cancer nurse and what we know is that that trajectory of, of a breast cancer diagnosis and illness can be up to 20, 30 years because we've become so good at treatment, but you can have exacerbations. And I liken that sometimes to what's going on with mental health because sometimes when you have a diagnosis of mental health and you're in an acute phase of your illness, you need all the services that are helping you but then once that's happened, you might go on and actually, you know, be able to be for quite some time without all of that intervention. But it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be checking in. And it doesn't mean just because you're actually going along quite nicely that you shouldn't have that check-in. So that's something that I really want to push as well during my time. Um, and you'll also be pleased to know that I've directed my department to have plans to expand in peer support groups to hear from the crucial voices in the community. Um, I, I encourage all of you, please, to make your voices heard. I know you do. Kathy's a really strong voice, and she and I appreciate her honesty. And I appreciate the fact when she tells me when you know we could be doing things better as well. I need to hear that. I'm not afraid to hear it. Um, but the thing is, I'm never going to get things better unless I have people that I respect in your sector that are telling me the things that I need to drive forward. Um, I also, how am I going for time, Kathy? Because I do tend to rave. You're doing okay. I okay. think a couple more minutes and then we'll get into some questions. Okay. All right. I just wanted to say too that um, one of the things that, and, and you may have heard me say this before, that is really important in what you do so well in the mental health sector and you're leaving the rest of health um, for dust with this, is you work with peer support workers. Um, it's something that I think the rest of the health system needs to learn from the mental health sector. It's something I feel really strongly about. I think that um, we've seen it work incredibly well in terms of our bushfire response, in terms of our drought support workers. Actually using people on the ground that have lived experience has actually been the feedback that we're getting is that those are the people that people are really benefiting talking to. Um, the one quickly I'll just finish up on is housing and we all know that if we can't get that right you know it's very difficult because you need a home and that's something that I'm hearing all of the time um, and it's look we're looking at different models I was in again in Victoria with Alan Fells and his amazing daughter Isabella and I went and had a look at um, oh have a, oh, what's it? Haven, sorry, Haven. And I was really impressed. I know a lot of people in the sector have said to me, you know, that maybe they don't like the idea of, of some of these um, things, but I saw it working really well. And I think there are a very, very small number of people that actually need that type of supported accommodation and things. So I'm, I'm really keen to keep looking at that. I'm really keen to keep up our, our HASI program and particularly HASI Plus. I think it's an extremely successful government initiative that's having great results. And thank you to all of you that are part of that and part of delivering that service. And I guess my dream for the mental health system is that um, everyone feels like they're valued, everybody has a place, and everybody feels that they belong. And that's something that I will keep pushing through and keep striving for. In terms of in terms of mental health in New South Wales, and I hope to do that with with all of you. And I'd like to thank you all for your lived experience, your families, your carers, your advocates, for everything you do. Thanks um, for being a great sector. As I said, I've been here a year, and I just I love your passion, I love your commitment, and I know there's a lot more to do. But I think we should all be well. You should all be really proud of what you've done to get mental health to the space that it is today. And a big shout out to One Door. Um, you know, Kathy, I met you pretty early on and I, I appreciate you involving me today. And I appreciate everything that you do and the incredible work that One Door does. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions that, that you have and thanks for hosting.
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And the hard thing about these things, Bronnie, I don't know if you find, um, you can't see the audience's faces. So we'll just have to imagine what people are looking like as uh, we're talking through them, but, but that's fine. And they might all be asleep. That, oh, we never know. We can, we can imagine them. But um, yeah, um, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for your insights on that. I think that um, mental health is, is such a complicated area. Um, and it's not just touching your portfolio, it's touching education, it's touching um, Department of Community and Justice. Is, there's so many, um, and I think it's just important around that, having that interface in so many of those different portfolios is so crucial, which is what you spoke of. Um, before we kind of get into some of the questions that we've got um, people posting and some others before was, just in terms of the national pandemic plan and yourself and the, the Victorian minister had um, some really important roles in that. Um, they indicated some, uh, there's a lot of pages. Um, it's difficult to know where this all sits in terms of the teeth of it. And I'm wondering, do you have a kind of take on where the teeth is and where, where are we actually gonna find the action? It has, the, the federal government has indicated some money in some of those areas. But for us here in New South Wales, what is that actually going to mean on the ground? Especially as people are living, um, we're all living through COVID, but what is this actually gonna mean for us here in New South Wales? Yeah, I think, uh, look, Kathy, and if I'm, I'm to be really honest, and I just, you know, appreciate if this didn't end up everywhere, if we could just, but I, I, I was a bit, I really was wanting to see a greater commitment um, with funding from the feds. Um, but I guess, I guess I probably would be silly if I didn't say that because I'm a state person, but the feds, you know, put up 43 million for that national plan and New South Wales has put up 73 just for COVID. Um, so I think, I think one thing, that will be really good is that they pushed a lot on data and a lot of using appropriate data and you would have seen recent data come out about you know suicide predictions and stuff during COVID and look and I don't know this for a fact so please don't quote me but what I'm told is that that data was made up with um, not incorporating any intervention right so those numbers are really high and the reality is of course we're doing intervention and states are the ones that are delivering so I, I want to, I'm really excited to see that investment in some standardised data so we all are aware of it, we're all contributing to it and we've all got the same information and data set so that we can talk about, so that when people do make comments about, about certain things that we're able to um, verify and validate that. Um, in terms of, I think, look, I think the good thing is the conversation started. In terms of the teeth, I, I want to see some peak, some teeth too, but what we're going to do is we're going to continue those meetings with the states mm -hmm. and we're going to also, we're partnering really well with Victoria. And look, I know too, um, it, is, it is a really good thing that you've got a coalition minister in New South Wales and a Labor minister in Victoria and we have so much mutual respect for each other and we have landed this together. And, and I think that if that's one thing I can say to all of you, that you know, it's really nice to be in a portfolio and, and have people that actually care about the issues and that take the politics out. And that's, I think, what we've done with all of the states. So um, you'll all get a chance, I hope, to look at that national pandemic plan. But what I think it does too is it gives us a springboard into talking about the rest of mental health uh, post in a post-COVID world. And I think that that's really valuable. And what it also demonstrates as well is, you know, we are, we are at table. New South Wales is at the table and I plan to hang on to that and be really strong on that. Yeah um, and I'd, I guess I'd encourage um, those sitting at the table to continue to invite those with a lived experience to be at the table as well as well as those of us in the sector and, and I'm sure I can speak for other not-for-profits in the sector who are supporting those with a mental illness and their, and their carers around how do we keep getting that voice raised um, and knowing the impacts that are occurring for, for the communities and stuff. So, yeah, so I, I think the sector would really welcome that kind of seeing the teeth. What does it actually mean? Who's going to be responsible? How is this going to be accountable? Um, so we can actually see it um, moving forward. So moving on to another question, though. Um, one of the things you raised, which I find really interesting, is around the housing. And um, at one door, we have a, a carer reference group. and they're a wealth of wisdom to me, um, carers who are supporting their loved ones who have a, a really serious uh, mental illness. Um, some of them are in really, um, it's great, we have regional um, carers who 
who phone in and or come in and it's it's wonderful some of them are up on the mid north coast around that space and and find it really difficult around that kind of supported accommodation that you're talking about um, have you got ideas about how where you're going to plan around this in terms of what you identified those really um, people needing more of that tailored kind of supported living those kind of things yeah look, i um it's it's you know i'm, I'm not going to walk away from the fact that it's a huge issue um and housing is a huge issue and we've seen that you know often um you know people with uh, you know an exacerbation of their mental health illness end up in housing accommodation that that contributes to making that worse and to not sort of helping the situation you've all seen that so i don't need to um um you know talk about that but um I think too, and I understand being a regional person that, it, that it's harder sometimes as well. Um, so I think that we looked at, you know, the pathways to community living and that's been a really, you know, a good success in a lot of ways, but we, you know, we probably we have to do more. Um, I want to hear from you, I suppose, as well, and I want sector-led solutions. I think that that's, you know, that's really the best way for us going forward. And as I said, I'm, I've had to open myself to, um, to you know, look at other models, and that's why I went to look at um, at the Haven in Melbourne to um, to have an understanding of that, and to actually speak to people with lived experience and people that had actually been living in this um, accommodation for years, and and it it was really I don't want to sound, but it was really moving in the fact that they said they'd been able to to find you know somewhere where they 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 were comfortable and they felt safe and they could be the best they could be so i think we need i'm look i'm open-minded i'm very um i'm very you know I'm, I'm very keen to hear more things i'm definitely looking at that at that haven model too but i'm really he happy to hear from any of you about you know how how you think we can help and do things better i've spoken with the minister um for housing melinda Pavey. And she's really keen to, to look at things as well and to look at existing infrastructure and, and what we can do and things like that. So we are trying. Is it complex? Absolutely. Um, but any ideas that anyone has or things that we can do, I'm really keen to hear them as well. All right. We might, I think some of the carers in my, um, in my committee would love to hear that. So we, we might take that up in another way. Um, you spoke before about your safe spaces that um, you're creating. And I did make note that you said that you were going to have, uh, was I right in so hearing that you said 20 um, across the state? Is that right? What you said? Yeah. So um, you know, uh, can you talk about a bit more about where they're up to and kind of um, ETA on arriving and the process where it's up to? Yeah, so we were hoping to get to um, delivered by um, the halfway through this year, but unfortunately COVID has presented some challenges with that because the people that we had working on it were deployed into sort of COVID um, type, uh, you know, responsibilities. Um, I can't tell you exactly where they will be yet, but I will be very excited to tell you when I can. Um, but look, I think that it, it works really well in Melbourne. I mean, that was ideal at their St Vincent's in Melbourne because particularly they have the most beautiful art gallery at the hospital. Um, and so it's art gallery by day and then they convert it into a safe space from five o'clock um, from Thursday through to Sunday. And it just means that people, they can, so say someone presents to the emergency department, they're very distressed, but they obviously need an intervention, they need some help, but they have to wait, right? Worst, worst place for someone who's having an acute episode to wait. So one of the peer support workers will then walk them over to the, to the safe space and they will sit down surrounded by all this beautiful artwork, which I won't be able to guarantee in New South Wales, um, but it's just this really lovely safe space. And they found um, that people come back to it, you know, that have done it, that they feel that it is a really safe space, particularly on things like Friday, Saturday, Saturday nights, when we see that elevation of presentation. So we'll be, we'll be mimicking that and we'll be looking at that and I'm really, and it was really interesting too because as a nurse, so as a, having a clinical background, I was a bit sort of at first because you know there's no note taking and there's no file on everyone and there's no, but I just had to sit back and think, well hang on Bronnie, just watch what's going on and what I could see was people in a crisis getting the help that they needed 
in a really calm, controlled and supportive environment. And the fact that no one was taking notes didn't matter at all. The fact that they might have needed follow-up was happening. So it was really, really positive. Um, and I'm really hoping that we have the same success in New South Wales that they've had in Victoria with that. Yeah. So when, when are you hoping, I guess, given COVID, you might actually have a few of them you can talk, like at least say, hey, we're on the road and we're starting the first couple in, you know, when are you hoping kind of time frame wise? I know COVID yeah. disrupted yeah. a lot. Yeah. So we, we should have, we were hoping to have one on the ground now and then COVID happened. So um, it, it's absolutely, I can assure you, I have made it a priority for my department and I'm really hopeful that in the next few months, that we'll be able to start operating at least two of them. Great, that's good news. We'll watch that space indeed. Um, yeah. Another question is about, um, which I know is dear to your heart around rural and remote areas. So in terms of being able to mm -hmm. offer better support in those areas, um, we know mm -hmm. from being a provider that um, finding the workforce is, is a real tricky um, to providing what is needed in those areas. So what steps are you, is the government taking around this to, I guess, provide that real special needed um, care in those regional and remote areas? Yeah, look, um, I'm a really big fan of the Rural Adversity Mental Health Program um, with those people that are on the ground. I think they're doing, I didn't really understand what they did before I became minister and I probably was wondering that, but I've become a really big advocate of that program. I think that they are cutting a new cookie and, um, and I love the fact that they just embed themselves into communities and so that you can actually know what's going on in a community in terms of mental health and mental well-being, which I think is becoming a very big part of what we do as well because they are embedded and they know what's going on. So I'm really keen to get more of them on the ground. I think that's been a bit of a success story. Um, also talking about the farm gate counsellors and, um, and the drought peer support program that's been really effective. I mean, we've got this terrific guy in Orange who um, was a stock carrier. So he was a truckie and he used to like, you know, move stock around for farmers. And then because, you know, the drought hit so badly and all the stock were being taken out of the, out of Western New South Wales, he would find himself, you know, experiencing those experiences that farmers were experiencing in terms of, you know, just feelings of helplessness, of depression, of anxiety. He's been one of our most fantastic drought peer support workers because he's lived it and because he can relate to people and because he can understand. So um, that's been really good. We've looked at the um, Royal Flying Doctor Ambassador Program where we've also looked at, that's about getting peer support workers and getting people in communities that then get extra training through the RFDS. And, um, and that's been a really successful program. So they actually go and, um, you know, they actually actively seek for people in those communities that could fulfill those roles and give them the appropriate training. And that's been really successful as well. And also working on a lot of um, Aboriginal social and emotional wellbeing initiatives, that's taken longer than I wanted, but that's because I have been so adamant about the consultation and the involvement of um, local Aboriginal communities and elders and anyone that needs to be involved so that these will be successful. I don't wanna just say, okay, we've got that funding, let's spend it because that's what it's got to be there because that's what's been happening too much. So um, so working on that as well. And obviously with the bushfire response, um, we've had to do a lot of work as well. And, um, and that's been a very um, difficult space at times because um, there's been a lot of expectation and um, things on mental health services when a lot of things that we've learned from other experiences, we need, we need to get people's homes back up and we need to get that infrastructure going and that's actually what's going to help them as well. One of the really positive things that came out of the horrendous fires that we suffered and, um, and look, I, I, was, I was very unfortunate in the fact that we lost our place over at Adelong, but it also gave me incredible insight into how our services were working and what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but one really great thing that happened in that was that we had a lot of uh, mental health teams from the metropolitan areas come down and work in our rural and regional LHDs. That cross collaboration, that learning, that opportunity to make networks and to get that support from people working in your field has just been 
absolutely incredible. And there's a great story of the clinical nurse educator from Westmead going and doing shifts on the acute mental health ward in Bega and what an incredible help she was, how she was able to educate and upskill a lot of the workers there and actually just give them a bit of a break. And I think we can explore that going further. So through awful crises and challenges come great opportunities like that. So, yeah. Uh, that's wonderful to hear. And I think that um, it's lovely to hear those uh, live stories and, and I guess what's happening on the ground and the impact. Um, and it is true, what I agree with you about getting the lived experience being front and foremost around really making a significant impact to all of us. So um, I'm, I'm aware of our time, um, Bronnie, and our audience, and uh, the, the minister has to go, to go very, very soon. Um, and I, the, the audience has been gathering a lot of questions, so um, we might take those on notice and, and I might see if we can get them over to your office, Bronnie, and um, see if we can address it or at least put some discussion points around it. As uh, we know this week, the Productivity Commissioner is going to be handing down their report to the government, the federal government, and so we're all going to be waiting to see, I guess, also in line with the pandemic plan, how it actually might impact and um, potentially um, have some alignment around that. So I think some of the things that the people are commenting about is looking at um, the pandemic report talks a lot about um, coordination and, and being able to help and integrate and all these big words. And there has been some really wonderful programs that have been around such as Partners in Recovery that was um, defunded from, by the federal government. But we saw some real amazing cross-sector collaboration between non-government, um, housing, um, LHD services to really help those with severe and complex mental illness. So there's been some really fabulous initiatives around that down there. Um, so I'd just like to say um, thank you for, for giving your time to us today. Um, and we will have you back um, another time to hopefully your face-to-face -face, um, symposium. Um, to our guests, I would just encourage you to um, keep following some of the webinars we've got coming up. Um, tonight at 6.30, we've got Dr. Anne Honey from the Sydney University um, and also a uh, researcher with lived experience who is uh, uh, Darren Wagner, who's a peer support worker at the Sutherland Hospital. They're talking about making lived experience research accessible in the lives of people living with or affected by mental illness. And it's the Stella study. Um, I strongly encourage you to get on board and, and hook into that. And also in the rest of the week, we've got um, continual webinars with um, people with a lived experience coming up tomorrow afternoon. We've got Professor Pat McGorry on Thursday morning. Stephen King, as I mentioned before, is coming on Thursday afternoon with our own New South Wales Mental Health Commissioner, Catherine Lowry, on Thursday. And then Friday, some wonderful um, news as we're hearing about um, the Caring Fairly survey, which um, the results of that. Um, and finishing off with Mostly Mad Music in the afternoon. So I, I just encourage you all, you'll see some of the links in the chat, um, but join it. Um, thanks again, Minister, for coming. Um, and Thank you to everybody for, for coming and we'll get we'll get your comments and questions over to Bronnie to, to consider as also is about mental health um, services here in New South Wales. Any final words, uh, Bronnie? Oh, no, look, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all and thanks for everything you're doing. You're welcome and love it. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye, everybody. See you then. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye. Bye.